Good afternoon. Welcome to Deep in History. This is your co-host, Marcus Rodi, joined by Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. Hello, Monsignor. Hello. Good to see you. We we're jumping back in. We're getting close to the end of Against Heresies with Irenaeus. I, I don't know. I, I didn't get the number of this particular episode. I think this might be 50. Uh, 49. 49. So we're getting real close. Uh, on another Coming Home Network thread, there's another program uh, going on called um, On the Journey with Matt and uh, Ken Hensley. Matt Swamey and Ken Hensley, and I think they're doing 49, even as I speak, they're doing the 49th episode also. So we've been in wow. parallel tracks uh, going this entire last year. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, audience, to go and check out their more, they're doing more apologetics uh, from their own journeys into the church. They're going through apologetic issues, uh, and they come out in our discussion of Irenaeus. Have you applied, Marcus, for to the Holy Seat? Um, so, if, if, can we give out plenary indulgences for those that stay with it <laughs> <laughs> all the way through? Right. So, all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's you think about it. You know, forty nine times at least an hour every time. That's a mess. Of, that's a mess of hours. So, I, I boy, yeah. I thank all of you that have followed us through to the end. We've come to uh, the section in. In Against Heresies, we're going to today we're going to go through Book Five, chapters twenty-five through thirty, pages in Keeble, four hundred seven through five twenty-two, and five hundred five hundred seven. Well, I'm sorry, five hundred seven. Yeah, to five twenty-two. We want to cover that whole section, and on the one hand, that's a big section, but because of the content. Um, we could spend, if we really dug into this, we could spend many weeks on the topics because the title of this episode is the Antichrist, and we're we're dipping into where Irenaeus deals with specifically head on the issue of the Antichrist judgment, and uh, specifically he's talking about discussing the uh, the uh, person person who's name is 666. And Monsignor, uh, you know, I read this section many times now, and I find it, I personally find it difficult to to talk about it. Not, not because I don't take the prophecies of the book of Revelation seriously, I actually really do. It's just that all of my Christian life, I've been so inundated because of the traditions I've been in through all the different interpretations of this, that I already had, I was already up to here with all the different conflicting interpretations. And then now when I dip into the early church fathers, it it becomes overwhelming to try and figure out where are we at in the way people understood Revelation. And Monsignor, you're, you're much more versed in the early church fathers. I mean, they didn't all agree on how to interpret Revelation, did they? No, they didn't. Um, I found a fascinating passage in Justin Martyr on this, too, in his dialogue with Trifo in uh, chapter 80 of it. He, he says, you know, we don't all agree on how to interpret this. That's pretty early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there was, so there's a consciousness that... Um, um, it's just not a simple matter. Yeah, we, and nearly every Christian who's in a, some kind of creedal church will generally say in worship either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, and when we do that, we're saying we believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe in the second coming, and we believe in judgment. We say we believe that. Um, and, but most of us live our lives as if that's something so far in the future that we just generally don't think about it. Or when we dip our toe into the book of Revelation and we're hearing about antichrists and beasts and with multiple horns and, and plagues 
and a woman uh, in the moon uh, stepping, you know, it's like, where do we go from here? Uh, and I, I will, I'll put a plug in here for another podcast by a good personal friend named Steve Wood, uh, who is the founder and president of Family Life International. He has a website called dads.org. But he has a podcast called Luke 21, in which he's every week he does a 15-minute broadcast walking through biblical prophecy in through the lens of St. Augustine. Highly recommend it. It's really very pleasant. It's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's really good. So he, I, we should have invited him, and we could have just sat back and let Steve talk about all this. But... You know, what do we do with the Antichrist? And I'll just, you know, Monsignor, I thought before we jumped into it, you know, I was brought up Lutheran, and I know that we studied it probably in Lutheran catechism when we went through the small, Luther's small catechism. But other than the fact that someday we're going to stand face, bef- face before God, accountable for our lives, that's about all that I got out of the idea of the the coming. And there was nothing about even thinking about should we be anticipating the Antichrist? Should we be anticipating the second coming? Generally, the idea was always, oh, there have been so many times throughout the last 2,000 years that people thought he was coming now and they were wrong, that he basically... Anyone that talks about the second coming or the Antichrist or looking for it, it's poo-pooed. And we just keep putting it off, back shelf. Later in life, when I had my adult awakening to Christ when I was in college, one of the first books I read was a book I'm sure you'd never read, Monsignor, because it's not probably on your shelf. It was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Oh, yeah. Hal Lindsey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> read it. So my point was, at the same time I was becoming awakened to Jesus Christ and awakened to Scripture and dedicating my life for that exact same time, all of a sudden I'm introduced to the rapture, the second coming of Christ. I remember reading a book called 88 Reasons Why He's Coming in 88. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so there was this imminency of it all in the 80s. It was a big thing. And then in the 90s, and then as we got towards uh, Y2K, a lot of Catholics as well as Protestants just assumed this was all it. And John Paul II talking about a new springtime and all the Marian apparitions, and then all that kind of came and went. And you don't hear much about any of the Marian that stuff anymore. There used to be a Marian conference almost every weekend in the late 90s, well, there just aren't as many anymore. And I've said in my writings that the problem whenever we attach our detachment to a date, when that date comes and goes, we lose our detachment. Credibility, yeah. Yeah. We, we, We lose the motivation. And I think that's what happens whenever we dip into these scriptures dealing with the Antichrist, the second coming, the beast, uh, the judgment. Uh, and I don't know what your history has been on that, Monsignor. Well, I, I grew up in, I grew up in the evangelical world um, as an evangelical free church guy. And I can remember um, both in church and Bible camp and all sorts of things, we'd have these prophecy conferences. And in the 1960s, you know, the fear was that the Antichrist was um, the Soviet premier. Um, I remember, wasn't there even a theory that, who was it had, that had that funny mark on his face? Oh, that was, um, um, oh, I'm having a senior moment here. Yeah. Um, um not Yeltsin. Um, oh, yeah, I can't think of it, but I, I can see yeah, it. Was Brezhnev or was it Brezhnev? No, no. No, Khrushchev? No. No? No. I it, can't remember it, it either, but, you know, that was it, that was the great bear from the north. It seemed to fit, you know, in terms of modern current events at that time. 
And, um, and then, you know, Ronald Reagan came along and destroyed it all. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, and I can guarantee that at, right at the moment we're that our bro- podcast is going to be um, released. You can find dozens of other podcasts on the internet about from Christians that are seriously thinking that we're in the end times in it's in oh sure yeah. and it's coming tomorrow and uh, in fact I've been reading a conversion story book about a woman who came out of the Seventh Day Adventists and she she talked about uh, how seriously they 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 took it and with all that being said see. Too often, mainline Christians and Catholic Christians say we we take it seriously, but because it seems so confusing on the Antichrist and what's the scripture saying and which scripture do we take seriously, and because we're inundated with so many opinions that we generally poo-poo it, or at least live our lives as if it's not something we need to worry about. And so maybe I, to put all my cards on the table, uh, I take it very seriously. I have a feeling I take it more seriously than most. And uh, so when I read in Irenaeus, his, some of his views, that it confirms some things that I take seriously, one of which is, the thing he said the last time we talked about, about the devil being bound. Yeah. To me, even though Irenaeus didn't make that connection, the idea of the devil being bound is language that connects us with Revelation chapter 20, where in Augustine talks about, who's about 150, 200 years after Irenaeus. Mm-hmm who in his city of God is promoting the idea of what we would call amillennialism. In other words, the age of the church is the time of the thousand years. And it begins with the binding of Satan, which Irenaeus says happened in the wilderness when Christ conquers the devil through the temptation, and the devil is bound. And Revelation says that that binding has to do with he's no longer able to um, mislead the nations, which is the idea that the gospel is now able to be proclaimed. Right. But John also talks in in. Revelation 20, which interestingly has been the readings in the Office of Readings recently. Yes, it's very interesting. If, for you're, doing, yeah. if you're doing the Liturgy yeah. of the Hours, it's, that's what we're, is that there will come a time towards the end of those thousand years when the devil will be loosed. And it's a time when he can once again mislead the nations. And I'm of the camp to think that we're in that time. I, I, you know, uh, I think it's, there's been a lot of church leaders that have implied that we've been in that time for a long time. Leo the 13th, I think there's some things that John Paul has said. There's things that Benedict has said uh, that imply that the apostasy that we're seeing is very real. Um, but the key, I think, it connects us with Irenaeus is not so much that, and I'd love your thoughts on this, Monsignor, not so much that when we see, if we're in the apostasy, if we're in the time that's crazy, and we see it going all around us, should we be ready to see the second coming of Christ tomorrow? And I'm of the ilk that says, no, that that's not, where our focus is to be. I wish it was. The focus is, in my view, that what Revelation and what 
the early fathers, I think, say, what Augustine says, and what the Catechism says, is that before that second coming, things are going to get a lot worse. I agree, Marcus. I I looked, um, and I couldn't find, I couldn't find any of the early fathers that actually argued the argued a pre-tribulation rapture for the, the saints. They all see the tribulation as a moment of testing, the ultimate test for the church and her people. Um, so, as you said, as you said, as we began, you know, we're all in, we're on the same, we're on the same train together. <laughs> yeah. Before we one, jump, before we yeah. jump into Irenaeus's view of the Antichrist, which we're just going to skim over it because there's so many views, I'm just going to take a moment to read what the Catechism says. So th- we're not going to read the whole thing, folks. But if you look at section 675. Through 679 is where the Catechism deals with everything that's in Irenaeus right now. Uh huh. If you so you're looking at Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Tertullian and the different views in the what do we? This is what the Church teaches. So at least no, but it says that before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Gang. Yeah. Now, some would say we've been through that before. Maybe. And and but. what we're getting, what we're seeing in these witnesses, Irenaeus, uh, others that we could quote, that final trial lies ahead of us. It hasn't come yet. Yeah. Um, Marcus said, this might be a good time just to throw, let me throw in one thought from... Um, Oh, please An do. earlier catechism of the church, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical lectures. Okay. Lecture 15, no, section how, 18. How, how does he relate to Irenaeus? I mean, you know, where at, historically? Okay, well, he'd be, um, he's writing about the year 350 or so. Okay. Um, so we're, you know, 150, 175 years okay. down the road. And it's interesting. It's so interesting because you know, um, at the time that, at this time now, the Emperor Constantine is on the throne, and some people thought that Constantine, being the first Christian emperor, inaugurates the thousand-year reign. Um, Eusebius basically dealt a, built an idea like that, and I was just so surprised and delighted to see Cyril saying this to the catechumens. He said, be on your guard, therefore, you know the signs of the Antichrist. Do not keep them to yourself, but share them generously with all. If you have a natural son, admonish him now. If you have one begotten by catechizing, put him also on guard against accepting the false Christ as the true. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. And then Cyril says, I fear the wars of nations. I fear the schisms of the church. I fear the mutual hatred of the brethren. But enough on these evils. God forbid that they be brought to pass in our days. Yet let us be wary. So much for the Antichrist. That section blew me away. Um, So there's this incredible sense that it, that um, the tribulation lies in the future, and it is all about testing the church. Yeah. And now my reading of history is that, and that's interesting you, you point that out, because in the ter- time of Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, even Tertullian, there, though Tertullian became convinced that the church was so st- corrupt that he left, towards the end of his life. Yeah. But I know that Basil will will write towards, I think Basil's in the 6th century, 5th century. Um, he's, in the, he's in the 4th century. 4th century. Well, he's, yeah. ha- he's going to write a real detailed description of how corrupt things have become in the church. So 
as you said, Cyril, and he's, they're looking to a time because the church is going through struggles, but there's been this great springtime under Constantine. But what they don't see is that there's a, there's a downfall to the springtime. And a lot of that has to do with the temptation by the devil to uh, become lax. Yeah. To compromise. To, to become popular. Uh, for bishops to want to be like the senators. In Rome, I mean, not all of them, but but there's this great, you know, it happens every time we go through a time when things become easy for Christians, right? It happens all through history. In fact, what I can't remember who was it, Ambrose, who was it that said that the martyrs are the seed of the church? Tertullian. You know, it was that. It was people that are willing to die in the midst of this. That was what made the church grow. It's when people start compromising that the church goes through struggles. What are we going through today, folks? And it isn't just that it's happened in the last 50 years. That's why I'm saying it's hard for me. If, if I were to say, when did this time of apostasy that John talks about in John Revel, in Revelation 20 begin— it's, it's hard for me to put a beginning date because the French Revolution, to me, was a part of this. And everything that came out of all the 20th century, just think about how many millions of people were destroyed through war in the 20th century. I mean, it's just, it, Lord Jesus. So we're going through a time of tribulation. We've been going through it. That it's happening, and in a way that Cyril and Irenaeus would never have seen. So anyway, folks, go ahead, Mutsu. You do you mind if I do one more intervention? No, or? please go. Yeah, bring okay. me back on track is what you're saying. I apologize <laughs> to everybody about this, but this is a great introduction to to Irenaeus, I think, as well. I. I pulled out um, the other day John Henry Newman's Tracks for the Time, yeah. Yeah. number 83, which he preached. These are sermons that he preached in 1838 uh, in during Advent in Oxford. Um, he was still an Anglican at this point, and he was preaching these basically as our friend Keeble here is translating yeah. Irenaeus. And I just thought this is such an interesting his point here, um, he goes through some of the texts of the New Testament and Old Testament and the early church, and he he's, he boils it down to four points, real short points. Um, Let us then apprehend and realize the idea, thus clearly brought before us, that sheltered as the church has been from persecution for 1,500 years, yet a persecution awaits it before the end fiercer and more perilous than any which occurred at the first. And he, he goes on to argue, make that point by saying that when we look at the witness of the early fathers who were living through persecution, they never connected their experience of persecution with these prophecies of the end times. Yeah. They saw that as something that lay ahead. So there's persecution. The second point he makes is this will be attended with the cessation of all religious worship. Um, no mass, no Eucharist. He quotes Augustine saying that one, Augustine wonders whether even baptism will be allowed. Um, so as part of this tribulation, then we may be denied access to the sacrament in the church. The third point he makes is that we'll see de desecration. Um, uh, the introduction of heathen idols into God's house. And the fourth point, deception. Um, uh, with the display of miracles. And, and he goes on, as some of the fathers actually wondered about too, will these signs and wonders be simply works of magic? Or will it be perhaps the discoveries of physical science that will um, um, 
basically, you know, overpower the imagination of such as not love God. And, um, and then, you know, they go on to accept that the world doesn't have a God. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's just those four points that he makes there it's just are amazing on this subject. It, to me, they parallel prophecies, if you will, that have been made over the last, he made that in 1838, have been prophecies over the last 200 years. Mm-hmm. By Leo the Thirteenth, by yes, yeah, uh, a number of the other popes, we we have Fulton Sheen being very clear on a very similar thing about fifty years ago. Uh, of course, John Paul has talked about this. Benedict talks about a remnant. The church is going to get much smaller. Um, and um, what was it that Cardinal? George said before he passed? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, it was about how he would, his successor, one of his successors might actually experience martyrdom. Yeah. yeah. Something like something that effect, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see that with all that was going on in the world in the years before Newman, I mean, we had a lot of religious wars going on around in Europe, uh, the Hundred Years' War and, and all that stuff that came after the Reformation, that he still looked to a time when it would get worse. And what amazes me is that there's no way that Newman could have imagined what we're encountering today. When Newman lived, now think about this, when he wrote those sermons, when Newman wrote that, there was no indoor plumbing. There was no, he didn't have indoor heating. We didn't have electricity yet. There was no radio. Right? I don't think Marconi no. had yet invented. He wasn't, not yet. No. Had, had not invented uh, the telegraph. So all the stuff that not only we take for granted, but we couldn't even imagine living without he never imagined. He was in the beginning, he was born essentially at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which has completely changed our world in an in a exponentially fast way that it's so hard to even imagine what our children are going to encounter and and. I just read this morning an article about how the birth rates have dropped so dangerously around the world. Italy and the United States are, are, are just horrendously uh, – everything is, is a rough time. and. What the church is saying and what scripture implies, I think, again, my view, is it's going to get worse. We'd love for Christ to come. You know, we've got Paul saying, you know, I, I don't know whether I want to live or die. You know, I, I don't care, but Lord, whatever you want, take me home or whatever, but I'll do whatever you want me to do, you know. And, you know, what's the word Maranatha mean? Come quickly. Come quickly. Yeah. So we, that's been the call of the church. Come quickly, Lord. Come on. Let's get it over with. But the interesting thing is when we say that, that, that also brings to front the reality are, okay, are you ready to meet him? If he came quickly, are you ready to meet him? Um, maybe, Monsieur, we could use that as a step back into actually getting into the text. Okay, I think that's a great idea. Because that's the issue. Um, an analogy is, to sum this whole thing up, is that, I don't think I've mentioned this in the actual program, but everybody that exists is on, a, is on the same train. We're all on a train, folks. We're all on a long train journey. 
And that train journey has one destination, and it's heading to judgment. It's heading to judgment. Aaron Hayes is talking about that. Now, there are people on the train that don't know that. Machin, you pointed out a verse where it's like blind mice. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, we, people on the, they don't think there's an end. They don't think there'll be a judgment. There's just this world. Their whole focus is on pleasure, on what's going on, oblivious to where the train's going, folks, and it's getting there. And you know what St. Paul said? He says, salvation is nearer than when we first began. It could be tonight, uh, folks. I'm sorry. I just, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm a farm boy. You know, I can't get this image out of my, <laughs> you know, we cut the wheat. We cut the wheat. Everything lies in, in that furrow. Or not the furrow, but you know, the, um, and then comes the, the combine. Yeah. And some of that goes into the hopper as grain. Some of it goes out the back end as chaff. And then we come along and gather it up, break it up and burn it or do what, put it in the, you know, let the cows sleep on it or something. But everybody, just as you say, everybody's on the same train, basically. Yeah, we're all on this. So there, but there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. Now, Irenaeus is writing about that in this section. That's what he's talking about. And he's doing it. What, which still amazes me whenever I read Irenaeus is that thoroughly it's a Bible study. That's what this is. Again, to imagine in his day his, his knowledge of Scripture. Now, this section that we're looking at is basically divided up basically into three topics. And we say basically is because it's they overlap a lot. But it's basically three topics. Essentially, chapter 25 and 26, he's dealing with the Antichrist. And most of that, of the text, is his um, quoting the scriptures. I mean, just think about the fact he had to handwrite all this. He, he, wasn't, he didn't have a nice little audio thing where he can read it and then it gets transcribed the way we do today. He's, he's doing it by hand with a quill. And he's not just telling the people, you know, why don't you go and look up Revelation chapter 20? Because they didn't have a Bible in there. So he quotes it all. But he covers all the passages that deal with the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians, Matthew 24, Daniel, Luke. He even has some, he pulls into John chapter 5, where he interprets the word another to be the Antichrist. Uh, he really is into Daniel and the Apocalypse. So it's all pulled in together. Irenaeus takes the Antichrist very seriously. And so let's just deal with the first section. Oh, and before I get there, the second section, which is chapter 27 through uh, about 29, he's dealing with the judgment and essentially the two ways. At the end of that train ride, folks, there's judgment and as you said, Monsignor, it's wheat or chaff. And he just, all he's doing is, he's just taking Jesus seriously. He, he's taking Jesus seriously. Uh, the, the Gnostics are coming up with all kinds of explanations, either to get around to it or reinterpret it, or, and they, we do that today. People are looking all kinds, no. There's one train ride, and at the end of that, when you're done, Revelation says, we will stand before God for what we've done in this life. And then I see Protestants and Catholics getting all over, well, what about justification and works righteousness and, and you know, all these different terms and all that. And it's like, take all that stuff, all those battles over words, is my view, take all those battles over justification and sanctification and grace and works and, and all the battles over that. Take all that stuff, put it in a bucket and just put it over there. 
Because the one thing is, at the end of the train ride, we'll stand before God for what we've done. Did we worship him? Did we believe in him? Did we surrender to him? Did we grow in humility and holiness? Did, did, were our lives dedicated? Did we grow in grace? And when we failed, did we turn and repent and to say, Lord, forgive me? And that's a common. That's what he is saying. Now, between here and there, Scripture talks about a couple things. Is this Antichrist, this, ant, this guy, this person that's going to be a flag that says, it's coming, guys. It's getting close. Right? That's what the, right. the, 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 the appearance of the it's Antichrist coming. is. It's getting close. And so since then, all the way to now, people are wondering, where's this Antichrist? What's he going to look like? And who is it? And, uh, and it, it, I'll just quickly go through this monster, and then, uh, and then uh, I'd really love your thoughts. We're gonna go, we're, I'm just going to summarize 25 to 26. What does he say about the Antichrist? Well, he's a slave to the devil. The Antichrist will take upon himself the might of the devil. He will be impious and unjust and lawless. He will come into our world as a rebel, unrighteous, a murderer, a thief. He will downplay and set aside all other idols, and he'll exalt himself as the one idol, as God himself. So that all, his goal is that all might be enslaved. And of course, Irenaeus gets this from all those different scriptures I mentioned. He says that he will sit in the temple trying to exhibit himself as Christ. And he, Irenaeus points out that the parables of Christ that talk about the unjust judge, he's talking about the Antichrist. And that the saints will go through a time of persecution under the Antichrist. Now, those who reject and blaspheme the Creator need to repent, and the worship of God are to know, are, will know, will see that these antichrists, those who follow the antichrist, are instruments of Satan. Now, Monsignor, there's kind of a summary. And if we were to spend a lot of time, folks, going through all those scriptures, as I encourage you to do yourself, he has them all there You can to see what the scriptures say in description of this Antichrist. But Monsignor, I'm going to throw it over to you, your thoughts on that first section. Right. Well, one thing I thought would be worth just looking at is on page 510. Okay. In, in um, uh, it says chapter 25, section 5. Um, and he's here, he, of course, is emphasizing again um, that God is providentially in charge of this whole thing from beginning to end. And his argument is th the same archangel, Gabriel, that gave um, the prophecy to Daniel, um, as he's the archangel of the creator, um, he's the same one who brought the good news to Mary about the incarnation. Um, and so I, I just thought that was an interesting note that um, this is the same, this is a, same archangel. Archangels only work for one God, the only true God. And so um, it's, he's again, emphasizing over against his Gnostic readers uh, or his opponents that um, there aren't two gods. We're not dealing with two different regimes here, but God is in charge of the whole thing, the Father, the true Father. That's one thing I thought was worth yep. pointing out. You know, one other thing I wanted to point out, he, he jumps at this later, uh -huh. but I, I think it's worth pointing out here, and that is on page, let's see, where is that now? Oh, way up on page 520, jumping way uh -huh. ahead, he says, at the very top, he says, 
and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but he, he talks about wherein he that addeth to or taketh from the scriptures, he that addeth or taketh from the scripture hath no small penalty laid on him. Now, the reason to point that out, we'll talk about that, people messing with the scriptures, but it emphasizes the fact that Irenaeus takes the book of Revelation as scripture. That's right. I mean, there was controversy in some of the books at different times of the canon, but Irenaeus unapologetically takes John as the author and that the book is scripture. And I think, actually, I think after Irenaeus now, there, it's pretty unanimous that John, John's revelation belongs in the canon of, of the New Testament. Yep. Oh, yeah. But okay. it was, you're right. There was a controversy there at the beginning. Um, hey, Marcus, on this, these, this first section, though, there are two other points I thought I'd Please. like to make. Um, Please. One, one is on page 512. Um, at, toward the bottom, you see where the note says St. Justin there? Yes. Um, it's just, I always... My, I always perk up when I see Irenaeus quoting one of the early yeah. fathers, just because it's interesting. So yeah. this is Justin Martyr, who is writing maybe 25 years before. We don't actually have this, this work doesn't survive. Um, but he cites Justin here that Satan, um, Satan did not know what his, um, uh, what his ultimate end would be. Well said Justin, before the Lord's coming, Satan never durst blaspheme God as not yet knowing his own condemnation. How that both in the parables and in allegories, it is so affirmed of him in the prophets. But since the coming of the Lord, he plainly learning from Christ's and his apostles' discourses that everlasting fire is prepared for him departing as he doth from God of his own will, as also for all who abide without penitence in their apostasy. Um, and I just, that's an interesting point he's making there about how um, that the consequences of the temptation were horrible for Satan. Yeah. And now he knows what, what his end will be. Um, Anyway, um, it was interesting how, how he quotes Justin here. And anyone who likes to look up texts, um, we don't have this, but Eusebius in his church history book 418 um, mentions this as well. So Eusebius is using Irenaeus. He's got him in hand here. And the other thing, it's more for fun now, this one, Marcus, on, on page 513. Um in section one, right in the middle of the page, therefore the advent of Christ will be nugatory and inconsistent with itself in respect of his not judging. What is nugatory? <laughs> That's what, isn't that what a, a, a Milky Way bar is made out of? Yeah. <laughs> Nougat. <laughs> isn't that what, the, yeah, I think so. I I did have to look that up, um, and it is interesting. Nugatorius is the Latin, um, worthless of no importance, and I guess it's a term. If there are any lawyers listening, I guess it's a term that's in in law. Um, if if you ignore the law, uh, you make it of no consequence, basically, and and that's his point here. If the father is not here to judge. If he does, if the Father does not ultimately judge, then what's the point of the coming of Christ? It's of no consequence. You, you've, you've, you've moved us into section two, which is good. Okay. Because the Antichrist is coming. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the Antichrist. But the, 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 the point, the most important thing here, is don't get focused on who he is and when's he going to come, what's he look like, you know, does he wear bibs, overalls, or what, you know. But it's about judgment, folks. And, in fact, I was going to back up just a little bit 
Oh, and sure. Okay. I want to just because what you just said there is so keen. And I'm going to hold it for just a second. If you back up just to the page 512, section two, before the, the section before you talked about Justin, I'm going to summarize, I'm going to read it, but I'm going to summarize it. He says, it's basically therefore. If therefore, the great God signified by Daniel things to come and confirmed them by his son, and Christ is the stone cut out without hands, which shall destroy temporal kingdoms and bring in the eternal one, then drop down four lines because he quotes the scripture. Let those repent as they are confuted who reject the creator and allow not that the prophets are sent by that father from whom the Lord also came, but affirm that the prophecies were made by different powers. For what things were foretold by the creator through all the prophets alike, those Christ fulfilled in the end, ministering to the will of his father and accomplishing what he had ordained touching mankind, such therefore as blaspheme the creator, go down four lines, let all worshipers of God know them to be the instruments of Satan, by whom Satan now and not before hath been seen to reproach God who hath prepared everlasting fire for all apostasy. Basically, he's he's taken everything he said so far and summed it up. And he's saying those who reject the Creator and those who are out there teaching people to reject the Creator are instruments of Satan. And to me, one of, in other words, what he's saying is that in this issue of judgment, one of the most important foundational stones of our belief is God as creator. Mm-hmm. Everything else, God as father, all this other stuff is important. But beneath that, as a foundational stone to everything, is God as creator. creator. That helps us understand who we are in relationship to creator, our existence, this world, our responsibilities as steward about sin, everything. And judgment has to do with our gratitude, our thankfulness, are based on a belief in creator. We're on that train going to judgment, and there are a lot of people on that train that don't believe there's a creator. Just turn on the nightly news. You'll see millions of people that don't believe there's a creator. Deny the creator. And when you undercut that, to the extent that, as you'll point out a verse later about being blind mice, they don't realize the extent to which they're being used as instruments of Satan. Yeah. Good. Irenaeus says it, you know, and I, that's one of the reasons why I, I like Irenaeus. He's saying it as it is. He's not getting caught up in, as everybody is, about who the Antichrist and all, but he's saying, but let's get down to the main thing here, and, and, and that's this issue of judgment. And beginning with section 27 on 513, all the way, if you will, through, uh, I mean, it's almost all the way to the end, but this issue of the two ways. There are two ways. And he says, interestingly, in in chapter 27, on page 514, he talks about Christ's coming will come on all alike. Well, first of all, back up there. You pointed this out. For if the Father judges not, all people will be on the same level, same lot, and the advent of Christ will be nugatory and inconsistent. And he gives all kinds of scriptures that say, well, you know, if if he's not judging, if there's not going to be judgment at the end, then everything is... Scripture is worthless. The coming of Christ doesn't make sense. Nothing. And Marcus, you know, as, as he begins chapter 27, he quotes, um, especially that quote from Matthew um, 10 uh, about uh, he came to divide a man against his father and a daughter against uh, her mother and so on. You know, the, the, Jesus Christ is serving his father's will 
when he comes and basically sets into motion this um, this final judgment that's going to happen or this judgment. And I thought, I know what I made here is um, if Irenaeus would have been with us today now, he would have found, he would say how wrong it is um, if we promote only the idea of a merciful and forgiving Christ. If, if that's all that Jesus is here to do is say, you're all right, folks, love you, come on home. Um, it just tears the whole thing all apart. At the bottom of that section, 513, the word has come for the fall and rising again of many. For the fall of those who believe him not, to whom also he hath threatened a greater condemnation in the judgment than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. But to the rising again of believers and of such as do the will of his Father, which is in heaven. There are two ways, folks, and I'm one that believes that's really the underlying issue of Scripture from Adam all the way to Revelation. There are two ways, either with God or you not. And that's what he talks about here. The coming, Christ's coming will come on all alike, and yet it will be judicial and will separate believers from unbelievers. Believers are those who do his will. Unbelievers and disobedient are those who draw not to his teachings. Chapter 50, 27, 2, to those who keep their love towards God, they will receive communion with God, light and life and all the good things that come with it. But those who withdraw from God, there will be separation from God, death, darkness, and the loss of good things. Chapter 28, page 515, those who run to the light and by faith unite with God, Christ gives the fruit of good things in him. That's who he talks about as being on the right hand, and they'll be invited into the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, those who withdraw from the light and from God, Christ brings upon them the evil therein. They're on the left hand, into the fire everlasting. And then in chapter 28, section 2 on page 515, again, these are all scriptures he's reflecting on, that when the Antichrist comes, he and those who come to him will be cast into the fire. So Monsignor basically, you know, he, he's, he's talking about the judgment. And I, I'd like to say that it's not that he doesn't delve into the, the intricacies of all those prophecies that you've, he takes them all seriously is the point. But he keeps bringing us back to really the, the bottom line is, guy, we're on this train <laughs> and there's one destination for us all. Yeah, I, Marcus, if I can just go back to the very top of page 514. You read it, you read this passage, but I just wanted to stop and underline this again. If then the advent of the sun cometh indeed upon all alike, yet is judicial. Think about the consequences of his, that word judicial there. Uh, again, just to make the point that... Um, I, what I'm hearing Irenaeus saying here is um, whether one ultimately goes to heaven or to hell is is the consequence of his own choice. Yeah. But what God has done in sending Christ back a second time is basically it's going to be a kind of a catalyst. Um, he is... He's the catalyst that's going to bring all of this to its fruition. Yeah. Um, he doesn't, it's a ju ju judicial setting, right? But he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, um, condemn somebody. He doesn't send somebody to hell as a positive judgment. He basically says, this is what you've chosen. Yeah. It, it, you know, you know, it's interesting to think that Irenaeus was trained by Polycarp, but was trained by John. And what is and he he's using the images of light and darkness and life. Mm -hmm. Think about John, the Gospel of John. Yeah. Or here's First John. This is the message 
In 1 John 1, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I see all of that behind what Irenaeus is writing here. Taking it seriously. Taking it out. Taking it very seriously. Now, did you have something else where we want to jump to the last part, Monsignor? Well, yeah, maybe... Um... Uh, going over to page 517, um, to chapter 28, section four. Uh, um, is that too far forward? For no, us? you can go ahead and jump. Okay. Yep. I did. I just, I was, I made a note of this as well too. <clears throat> um, for this cause in all time, man who was framed in the beginning by the hands of God, that is of the son and the spirit. We've talked about that before. Yeah. Um, he is being made after the image and similitude of God by the casting away of the chaff, that is, the apostasy, and by the gathering into the garner of the wheat, that is, such as by faith bear fruit unto God. And therefore, this is the important point, tribulation is necessary for such as are saved that being in a manner bruised and beaten small and by patience kneaded up with the word of God and put into the fire, they may be meat for the king's banquet. So, you know, this process of being renewed after the image and likeness of God, um, the work that Christ has come to do, it, it, Irenaeus says it necessarily involves tribulation. Um, and so again, I think, you know, I just make that point because we would be mistaken if we thought that um, all real, all true Christians are going to get raptured out of this world before the real challenges come. These are the challenges that are going to uh, help shape our image, strengthen our image um, as, as sons and daughters of God. Yeah, that reminds me again, a, a foundational idea from John. In John 15, he says, Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every yeah. branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He prunes. That was the lesson for last Sunday, yes. Exactly. Yeah. The tribulation. You know, there's all kinds of, of scriptures that talk about the disciplining of a son by a father and, and our growth. I was trying to find that passage that talks about how suffering produces perseverance, and I think it's in James or first, you know, one of the letters of Peter. You know, the necessity of that, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we're, we're going to face tribulations, folks. Sometimes, I think I mentioned last week, that we think that our goal as Christians is to so purify our government and our culture so that we can live our faith, uh, you know, without trial and tribulation. But that's not the world God's put us in. What's important is, is living out our faith We're, uh, in the midst of trial and tribulation. Yeah, go ahead, Father. Well, I was just saying, where did I read this? He quotes... He quotes Ignatius somewhere along here. Oh, um, oh yeah, it's um, you, oh yeah, in on in section four there on page five seventeen. Um, Therefore, his tribulation is is necessary for such as are saved. Um, I've read that here. Yeah. Um, as said, one of our own people condemned to the wild beasts for his witness unto God. I am God's corn, and by the teeth of wild beasts am being ground, that I may be found a pure leaf. 
See the note there, Ignatius yep. of Antioch, his letter to the Romans, section four. Yep. Now that would have been in the early 100s when that was written. Here, Irenaeus is quoting it. I just thought that was a pretty interesting point too. As um, sin, one of our people. One of our people. And there's no doubt who he's referring to there because he literally, he quotes that section in Ignatius to the Romans. Makes you wonder why he didn't say Ignatius, why he, he kind of alluded it, to yeah. him and didn't mention his name. So maybe he's doing it by memory when he's writing this because uh, he's heard the story, but he's, yeah. you know, he knows the quote. Yeah. He knows the quote. I, I, we've not compared to see whether it's word for word from the quote. So we talk about and the ant. And he, you know, sorry, and then you know, Ignatius, his point to the Romans was, um, don't interfere with my being persecuted because this is the road to true discipleship. Yeah. And I think he's learning, he's taken that lesson and he's telling us um, not to be afraid of what lies ahead of us. This is, this is part of the path that we will walk to become perfect disciples. Sorry. No, that's very good. So we have the Antichrist is coming. And he goes through all the scriptures that deal with the Antichrist. And second of all, what's more important, though, is that the coming of the Antichrist will be a signal, if not a reminder, that what's at the end of the journey, folks, is a judgment, a separation. And he does emphasize the importance of belief in the Creator. And I, I and I, I I I can't reinforce that. That that's why I'm also very discouraged about our educational system in our country that so influences our kids to come up with every other explanation for the reality of the world other than a creator. When in fact, they may not realize to what extent they're instruments of Satan. But under country, the most foundational thing our kids need to know is that they are creations by a loving creator. And then the, the third part he gets into here is, okay, because he's dealing with scripture, it's this whole thing about the 666 thing from Revelation. Those of you, you've, you've, you've read it in Revelation. Um, and that begins on page 517 at the top. And he's referring to Revelation chapter 13 um, in, I think it's, uh, verse 18, 13, 18. And shoot, I'm sorry, I should have had this at hand here. He's, you know, an image saith he will be, com he command to be made for the beast and he will give breath to the image so that the image may even speak. And those who will not worship it, he will cause to be slain. This is the Antichrist doing this. And a, man, and a mark too, saith he, he will cause to be put upon the forehead and in the right hand that no man may buy or sell unless he have the mark of the beast's name or the number of his name. And the number is six. Six, six. And then Irenaeus proceeds from then on through the end of this section that we're talking about to discuss who is this 666 and what's it mean? And he's using different analogies of it. One thing he talks about is referring it to the six days of creation. And since a day is as a thousand years to the Lord, that this he sees that the consummation of the world will come out in 6,000 years. And we know, Monsignor, that over the centuries, many took this as the idea of trying to, when's this Antichrist coming? 6,000 years or so from, you know, whenever. And I just read a story recently about the, in the 19th century, all these different uh, Adventist groups that were arising in America, they had inter interpreted Daniel and when, uh, when 
Daniel was spoken, and then so so many thousand years from then is therefore that's why they were, they thought in 1840 he was, Christ was coming again. You know, we get caught up in all these things. Um, but not only did he did he recognize that it's it's hard to identify who the six 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 is referring to, but in it's interesting that in the beginning of chapter thirty. Um, he says another part of the problem is that we've got some bad translators out there of the scriptures that make it even more complicated. Yeah. 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 I was just, before we jump into chapter 30, but I, one after he, he goes through all these different theories of who the identity of 666 is. And if anyone wants to have some fun, you know, just to get one of those, um, charts of the ancient Greek and the values of each of the numbers that you could start playing around with names. I, it's like a crossword puzzle almost, you know, but, but he points, he says, um, ultimately this is fruitless, um, because we are not given, we're not given that, um, the bottom of page 520 in section three, it is safer and less perilous to await the event of the prophecy than to make aims and auguries about the name. So at the end of that whole section, basically he has only one positive conclusion about the identity of, of the Antichrist. And, it se- and I wondered if you had any thoughts about this. It seems to be that, that, he, that the Antichrist will be somehow associated with the tribe of Dan toward the bottom of page 520. Yeah. Um, Je- Jeremiah hath signified not only a sudden approach, but also the tribe of which he shall come. Um, and then and then he concludes, Irenaeus notes that this aforementioned tribe is not named in, in the book of Revelation among those which are to be saved. So that seems to be the only positive thing we walk away with here in this section is that the Antichrist will somehow be associated with the tribe of Dan. Well, he says the tribe isn't addressed, but um, in Revelation 21, when it it, it talks about the, uh, the New Jerusalem, and it goes through the details of the New Jerusalem, it says there'll be 12 doors in the 12 tribes. So it doesn't leave out Dan. Good point. He doesn't say there's 11 doors. There's 12 doors in Revelation 21. There's also 12 foundations of that building, the 12 apostles. Right. Yeah, you know, we had to replace one of those guys. That's That may be the... <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I didn't want to... Us, you know, Matsu, we didn't want to get into this. Or, um, no. But... Uh, just two things because of the time that I'd like to, three things I'd like to point out that I, uh, there's one that's a bit of a conundrum. I almost hate to mention this because I can just see the rapture people s- jumping on this and saying, see, it's way back in Irenaeus. If you go into 518, in 518, page 518, he says, no, let me think, find it here. He says, and therefore, when in the end, the church shall be suddenly taken up from hence, there shall be, saith he, tribulation such as was not from the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last struggle of the righteous, wherein they all who overcome are crowned with incorruption. Now, we've already been talking for over an hour, so... I don't know what to say on this one because I can see the rapture folks saying, see, he's talking about that the church will be taken up and then there'll be tribulation. And I read it uh, another way, lifted up, just as Christ was lifted up. I don't know if the text supports that, but I mean, it certainly, you know, he's, Irenaeus is very clear that the church is going to be um, experiencing tribulation. So 
Uh, anyway, I don't know exactly how to well, explain that either. Well, I wanted to I wanted to bring this in, folks, because yeah. next week we're going to go on and we'll be talking more about his view of the end times. So we're not going to ex- lose that. All right. Okay. Second of all, I did want to point up in five eighteen also. The next paragraph, and therefore in the beast, when he cometh, there ensues a summing up oh, yes. of Thank all you, iniquity and all deceit. I'm throwing that to you because that's a significant connection. That Yes. I made a note of that, too. Um, that's uh, in 5.29.2, uh, right? Yes. Yeah. That word that he's using there, summing up, we've talked about this before in terms of Christ. Christ's ministry coming in the incarnation was to was recapitulating or summing up, summing up the world um, and remaking creation. So um, Satan represents a summing up of everything that is evil and all deceit. It's all, I mean, he basically owns it all. Um, in contrast with Christ summing up, we're recapitulating the world as it should be, as it was originally created by the Father. But that word summing up is a technical is, word for him. Is the recapitulation. There's, yeah. you know, this, this idea, as we talked about last week, that Christ sums up all death, takes all sin, and, all, and he takes it on to himself, all of death. He takes it up into himself, we talked about last week, onto the cross. And it's here we have in the end the beast. All of that evil will be summed up in him and thrown into the fire. There's a parallel to that in the judgment. Sometimes we, we have to encourage people that think that life is meaningless, their lives are meaningless. This section says every human life is is has meaning um yeah. and even those that are uh, are destined for the wrong you know the other direction we we you know we talked about that you mentioned this at the top of page 518 um they're like mice blind mice hidden in the deep of folly they don't know what's going on but yet there will be a purpose to them as well um so far so to be so far useful and meet for the righteous as the stubble is in use for the growth of the wheat and the chaff, therefore, for burning for the working of gold. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, everything about human life is of consequence. I think that's what he's saying here. On the 519 at the bottom... I just I got two more things just to point out, folks, before okay. we go. And um, is this issue about the transcribers? We've kind of mentioned it. The people that oh, are yes, that's right. Yeah, you know, it says in this. I suppose it's kind of two thirds of the way down. And this I suppose to have been the fault of the transcribers, as often happens, since numbers also are expressed by letters. And so we're we're getting into the fact that you know that. Um, the introduction of the numbers that we're so used to was a later addition into our languages. I think it came from India, didn't it? In Latin, it was always letters until later the, the idea of one, two, three, four, five, and all that added was later. I'm, I'm almost sorry, positive. I, I'm almost positive. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. But anyways, he goes on in, in, in here, but here's what I just want to point out. Down towards the end. Now those who did so simply and innocently will in all likelihood find pardon from God. So so people that change things in the scriptures, look at the bottom of any Bible and there'll be footnotes and they'll say, well, in in certain texts, this was this and that. We know that, especially the Old Testament. Contradiction between the, the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible, it's all over the place. But those that made those mistakes innocently be pardoned. 
but all who through vain glory laid it down that names of a mistaken number are enacted by law and define the name contrived by themselves as being that of him who is to come, these will not go away guiltless, having moreover deceived both themselves and those who put confidence in them, wherein first there is damage in their missing the truth and receiving that which is not as though it had being next whereof Whereas he that addeth to or subtracteth from the scriptures hath no small penalty laid on him, such as one must needs incur the penalty. So here he's quoting Revelation. And he's talking about those that pick and choose from scripture. On the one hand, those that are copying and making it different. We know that there are, to this day, there are some scriptures that we aren't really sure an example of that, and I, uh, I mentioned it to you, Monsignor, at the beginning is in 1 John, where he says, um, in, in 1 John, he says that the reason he's telling all these things to the people is because our fellowship is from the Father, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. But there's a footnote. And if you look to the footnote, it says, Other ancient authorities read your. So we don't know if John was saying that he's telling the gospel to them so that our joy might be complete or so that your joy might be complete. We don't know. It's a both and. What Irenaeus is saying, if a guy did it accidentally, he'll be pardoned. But if you're messing with the Word of God, you're in trouble. My point for bringing this up is, there are a lot of people that use Scripture to make it say what they want it to say. Yes. There are people that have their own agenda, and then they take a Scripture to say what they want to say, or they'll emphasize this verse and ignore this verse. There are whole churches out there that are based on a few scriptures here, but we're ignoring these scriptures. And that's one of the reasons why in our work, Monsignor Wright, why we call people back to the church. Because we want people to have the fullness, not just a part of the yes. apostolic gospel. Yeah. Well, but thank you for that one, Marcus. Last thing, and we'll at the very end... Chapter 30, page 5, 21 and 2, the very, very end. He says, and I can't remember if you, you might have mentioned this earlier, but I think it's a good place for us to close. At there at the end of 3, we, you see, do not venture anything as concerning the name of Antichrist in the way of positive affirmation. For if it were meet that at this time his name should be expressly proclaimed, it would have been spoken by him who also saw the apocalypse. In other words, John would have told us. But this number of his name he shewed that we should be on our guard against him when he cometh, as knowing who he is. Though of his name he was silent, for it is not worthy to be proclaimed by the Holy Ghost. Then the next page, however... When this Antichrist shall have wasted all things in this world, reigning three years and six months, and shall have set in the temple of Jerusalem, then shall the Lord come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, on the one hand sending him and his subjects into the lake of fire, on the other bringing with him to the just the times of the kingdom, in other words, the rest, the seventh day sanctified in restoring to Abraham the promise of the inheritance, in which kingdom the Lord saith that many coming from the east and the west sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we don't know his name, but he's coming. And when he's coming, there'll be the judgment. And the Holy Spirit didn't think it worth mentioning his name because he's just going to be here for a short time. When you Put him against eternal glory. Um, he's just hes just like a piece of chaff that's going to be burnt. Yeah. yeah. So I thought what I took from that is um, we should be alert. 
we should be attentive to the signs, but we shouldn't be afraid. Yeah. And I do think the times, the, the signs of the times our Lord tells us to read would say that, would we say this is the end that we're in? Well, we can't say that. Just like Irenaeus is saying, I can't tell you I know the name of this guy. But does our world indicate that we're going to go that we're going through tribulation? I think we are. And so his point is, well, then how should we live our lives? That's the point. How should we live our lives? That's the point of what John was saying in his letter. That's that's how should we live our lives? It's not about getting caught up on calculating the numbers and which name. How should we live our life? Because um, this could be our last day, our last week, our last month. We don't know that. So we ought to live in holiness, which is what Irenaeus has been calling for throughout the whole book. Matthew, why don't you close us in prayer, and then we'll pick up right, next okay. week as we continue in our getting close to the Very end good. of our study of Irenaeus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of all holiness, guide our hearts to you. Keep in the light of your truth all those who have freed from the darkness of unbelief. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Monsignor. And thank all of you for joining us on this episode of Deep in History. We look forward to joining you again next week.